Let us pray. Gracious God, we would ask that, that the simplicity of this commandment, that it would speak to the complexity of our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> As if plain old robbery was, eh, that wasn't bad enough. Now we have cyber crime, you know, hacking, computer hacking. We have that to worry about. And so I always wonder, who are these people? Who are these people? Each time I get one of these really weird emails, and I get a lot of them, they're trying to entice me, just click on this link. Obviously, whoever they are, these hackers, they couldn't care less about the Eighth Commandment. Obviously, they are not so worried that God just might be watching, watching them and judging them. So your PC, it gets hacked, or maybe it's your company's computer system that gets hacked, and the next thing you know, you're being bribed. Pay up. Send your money here or else. This happens on a small scale, like a couple years ago. We announced it in church because we wanted everyone to know that our system, our church system, had been hacked and that we were threatened, pay up or else. Well, we decided we didn't need to pay up, as John knows well. Uh, we decided we didn't need to pay up because the breach wasn't too bad in our case. But then, of course, there are these hacks that are on a gigantic scale, like the, the, the ransomware hack of the Colonial Pipeline just a few weeks ago that caused long lines at the gas stations across parts of the country. Colonial decided they had to pay, Colonial Pipeline decided they had to pay be, because of those, well, like the breach, it, it, it compromised their entire system. And so we wonder, why can't these crooks just leave us alone? Friends, God fully understands. God fully understands the dark side of the human heart and the human nature, which is why God gave us these Ten Commandments, which speak to us in a variety of ways, and today speak to us about stealing, the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. Have you ever been the victim of a robbery? I'm actually extremely fortunate. It's very odd to even say, having lived for, well, I shouldn't say this, but I will, if the, all those years in New York. <laughs> I never was. And I don't think anyone in our family, I could be missing that, but anyway. But so I've heard from a lot of people, and it's common talk about how uh, th when you are a victim, it's one of the worst feelings you can have. I'm, have. I'm told it's a feeling of violation, where sort of safety, you, you feel less safe. Safety is compromised, and trust, a level of trust is broken, no matter how small the crime might be. On the other hand, has anybody here ever, ever stolen anything? Petty larceny or not so petty? as a child or as an adult. <clears throat> I believe that most of us, one way or another, very small or often, usually very small, and maybe especially as kids, have done so. But thankfully, for most of us, it's minor stuff, and thankfully, we've gotten beyond that, and it's not a slippery slope for us, but not always. It's not always so isolated. It can be a slippery slope, and it can lead to bigger things. A highly respected member of our church in Brooklyn, one of the leaders, he didn't pay his taxes for 20 years, but not because he came up with, uh, you know, good tax advice, no. He didn't file his taxes for 20 years, and he went to jail for it. 
how do you live with that kind of stress? Hoping, hoping not to be caught. So there's all kinds of ways to steal. And there's even one of the basic ones, shoplifting. And you think maybe, well, you know, maybe I can get away with it. Anyway, who's it hurting? Friends, it's hurting you. Whether you are being stolen from or you're the one doing the stealing, both sides of the coin are very bad for everyone involved. And that's a big part of what the Old Testament laws, laws, not just the Eighth Commandment, but the wide scope of laws that, are, that address stealing, these Torah laws, they point towards how bad it is for the community. It's a main concern of many of these Torah laws. The main concern is that stealing is a threat to community trust and to the sense of stability and safety within the community. And so the Torah laws, they seek to incentivize the citizens to think about stealing, and when they, if they think about stealing, or are tempted to think about their neighbors, to have them in mind, to think about those whose, who your actions might be hurting. The Torah laws seek to incense, they go really far in this. They seek to incense us a sense of obligation to our neighbors going so far. And one of the laws says, even if you are out and you see a donkey wandering, you see a donkey of your neighbor wandering about, and even if it's your ha- a, a neighbor who you don't like, even hate, that's a word used in Scripture, you are obliged, you are required to return that donkey to their owner, otherwise it's considered thievery. The Old Testament penalty for taking of things, usually it was animals, ox or donkeys, it was restitution, was the usual penalty, paying back, and it was almost always multiples of what you, the value, multiples of the value of what you stole. It was meant to be painful. But of course, Not surprisingly, when the stealing was of human beings, kidnapping, the penalty was the ultimate, death. The Torah doesn't mess around when it comes to stealing. Anything that compromised harmony in Israel, it was serious business. And so, friends, I don't think I have to go very far to convince anyone that stealing is bad. It's bad for us individually. It's bad for society. It's bad for everyone. But there's another way to look at this, to look more inside, to look into the heart. And I think Zacchaeus, our friend Zacchaeus, can help us with that. What's remarkable about this story that Andrea alluded to and Pastor Moira told is that is how much Zacchaeus is changed by his encounter with Jesus. Look at it. Let's look at it from his perspective, from Zacchaeus's perspective. He was a tax collector and probably like most tax collectors, he was the most hated man in his town, in this case Jericho. And he was a chief tax collector, so he, was a ta- he had tax collectors reporting to him. He was hated not because of his wealth. He was hated because of how he earned it. And one way to capture that is that tax collectors, along with thieves and murderers, those three categories were not allowed into the synagogue to worship. They were considered, tax collectors were considered basically thieves. And at some point earlier in his life, Zacchaeus must have, it's not in the Bible, but he must have, he he had to have, made a decision to go into this profession despite knowing full well the way he would be perceived by his fellow Jews. 
tax collectors were notorious for two reasons, for two reasons. First, they took off of the top of the taxes they collected, and they had the Roman the long arm of Roman law behind them, they were able to take off the top whatever they could get away with, and they tried to get away with a lot, and they put a great burden on the people. And the second reason is that they were in league. They were representatives of local representatives, Jewish representatives of the hated Roman overlords. They were seen not only as thieves, but they were also seen as traitors to their people. As we come to this story, clearly, our friend Zacchaeus, this was weighing on his heart. So much so that he was willing to step out into the town because he heard this Jesus was coming to town and everybody, this is towards the end of Jesus' ministry, he's on his way to Jerusalem for the final days and he's traveling through this fairly small town of Jericho and he, and he, he, he um, uh, Zacchaeus, Hated, he was willing to step out in the regular crowds and have the people nudge him or look at him askance or even worse. He was willing to take that risk of being in the crowd. He must have been willing to do it because he'd heard about this Jesus. Especially he'd heard that Jesus was willing to eat with people like him. Tax collectors the most, even the most hated. And so he's thinking, maybe, maybe there's some hope for me here. Maybe I don't have to be such an outcast. We actually do not know what Jesus said to Zacchaeus, other than saying, I want to come to your house and stay at your house. A great honor. We don't know anything else he said to him. But we do know that those words in that encounter changed Zacchaeus dramatically. So much so that Zacchaeus gave away half of his money to the poor, and he promised, he promised, a public promise, to pay back four times over what he would have been thought of to have cheated defrauded people out of four times over. That's more than the average that the Torah asked for. So the question is, what changed him? Maybe it was the simple fact that Jesus was willing to come and pay attention to someone like him. Maybe Jesus, in that conversation, reminded reminded Zacchaeus about the Eighth Commandment and that God would not be happy that he was breaking that commandment. Or maybe Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or maybe Jesus said, you know, Zacchaeus, you can change. If you repent, and repent means change. If you repent, God, I promise God will forgive you. Or maybe Jesus said, remember, Zacchaeus. God created you just like those sparrows up in that tree. God will take care of you. You don't have to steal. You don't have to cheat to get by. You should have confidence, and that'll help you make wise choices. Whatever Jesus said, Zacchaeus was a new man. And is there any doubt that he lived his life totally differently for the rest of his life? Friends, when we trust, like those sparrows, that God's eye is on us as well, it's then that we gain a sort of inner strength that Ephesians talks about. An inner strength, born of faith. And it's then that we can start to live with more joy and more confidence. Trusting that no matter what, somehow God has our backs now and eternally. 
and trusting that God's love and power as exemplified in Christ surpasses all understanding. And with that, we can trust that God can deliver far more abundantly than we can even imagine. It's then that maybe we can drop troubling habits and maybe sing. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow and I know he's watching me. Zacchaeus would have loved that song. 